Welcome to the State of Affairs in partnership with Serbian Radio Chicago. We are having conversations that matter. And very honored today to be joined by John Pierce, who leads an elite attorney's law office, uh, Pierce Law, and also leads another organization that he is going to tell us about. And he has a fascinating story. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Olga. Really a pleasure to be on with you. And I didn't want to fumble it, but tell me about something that is compatible to ACLU, but you have another organization that actually is um, a pendant to that. Sure. Uh, so I founded the NCLU, the National Constitutional Law Union. Uh, I actually founded it a couple years ago. Um, and essentially, it's uh, it's there to fight for the constitutional rights of um, of all Americans. Um, you know, I represent more January 6th defendants than any lawyer in the country. Uh, I've been involved in representing folks from uh, Carter Page and the FISA abuse uh, litigation to uh, Laura Loomer to Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, Rudy Giuliani. And so you know, there are just lots and lots of litigations that are happening right now because of the sort of encroaching tyranny that we're seeing um, from the American government and, and really across the world. And so I felt that there needed to be an organization um, that fought for, uh, really fought for constitutional rights, as opposed to, uh, you know, the ACLU has really become a, a weaponized tool for the left. Um, and so, um, you know, it's there to help to fund these kind of litigations. A lot of these folks do not have the resources for these uh, litigations. And so if folks are interested in checking it out, it's uh, www.nclu.org. And there's lots of uh, information there. And I think one of your prior guests, uh, Gavin Wax, is actually the executive director. Um, and so we're very excited to have him and it's uh, we're off to a great start. Excellent. And we will share all of this information within this video. But there is a background fascinating story that I want to talk to you about given um, our listeners and, of course, the Serbian-American background, you grew up in a Serbian family and you have been baptized in a Serbian Orthodox Church. I think that is such an important part of why, obviously, God works in mysterious ways and puts us all together for a reason. So tell me about your background, actually. Sure, absolutely. So despite uh, my last name, which I suppose is Irish or something like that, uh, my mother's maiden name is Stepanovich. And all the names on uh, her side of the family, uh, they range from uh, Stepanovich to Markovich, Voinovich, Vukovich, you know, Rainovich, um, the whole deal. So I was, um, I, I was baptized, I'm a baptized Serbian Orthodox Christian. Uh, I was baptized at, uh, I believe it's Holy Trinity uh, Serbian Orthodox Cathedral in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania grew up in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's the heritage. Uh, that's the religion that I, that I grew up with. Um, my, uh, my grandfather uh, on my mother's side uh, immigrated um, from Serbia when he was, I think he was 10 or 12 years old, uh, came over to work in the, uh, the coal mines and the steel mills mm -hmm. in Western Pennsylvania with so many other Serbs and, and folks from uh, Eastern European countries from that part of the world, sort of at the turn of the century, late 1800s, uh, early 1900s. And, um, so yeah, that's you know I I don't I don't speak the language and you know know quite as much of, of some of the intricacies as some of my cousins and aunts and uncles um, who I, I grew up in Erie, a couple of miles north of Pittsburgh, and um, you know Pittsburgh is really where that was kind of focused for us. So on the holidays, um, you know J January seventh, uh, and then yeah. uh, Julian calendar Easter, um, you know I always got uh, two two Christmases and usually two Easters. And so, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing uh, part of my childhood and still a huge part of my uh, my life and my family's um, uh, heritage. Excellent. So just even speaking of Pennsylvania, such an important state in terms of our electoral votes and looking back at 2016, it was actually Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, particularly in some of those districts that you know yourself where uh, Serbian Americans lived that flipped from Hillary Clinton to President Trump. So obviously the American Serb community has had lately some impact on the elections and on the political process, which is something that we are really um, trying to stand up for and, and um, kind of agitate for so that the Serbian American community, having been around, as you yourself said, since the 1800s in the United States, like your grandfather and, and um, that entire environment, um, they've built this nation and it's incumbent upon them to, to reintroduce themselves into the political process. But speaking about that, you 
represent some very high profile cases. And I say high profile because they have been so significant in the past several years in terms of what is going on politically in the country. Tell me about the Kyle Rittenhouse case and how that impacted 2020 election and that quote unquote summer of love. Sure. Uh, well, I, I lived that uh, for about five months. It was one of the most intense <laughs> uh, episodes of my entire life. Um, it, so, you know, essentially, um, you know, what was going on in the few years prior to that with respect to me and my and my law practice is that, um, you know, I had I had seen and noticed what was starting to happen um, in the country and, and, and behind the scenes, even with respect to uh, the way the, uh, the, the justice uh, system or so-called justice system had started to be weaponized uh, against President Trump with respect to the uh, the Russia hoax and the FISA abuse uh, against Carter Page. And so I I, uh, I actually was the lawyer who represented George Papadopoulos, who got uh, and we got him pardoned by President Trump. Um, that who is led... a very good friend and dear friend and often a guest here at Serbian Radio Chicago. Yes. And I haven't talked to him in a couple of years, but, you know, I was really close with George uh, and his, his wife, Simona. And um, I know he's Greek Orthodox. And so it's uh, it's great to hear his name again. Look forward to to talking to him again soon. Um, yes. We we were the ones that uh, took over his case um, when he wanted to switch lawyers right around the time he was being sentenced um, uh, there with respect to the Russia hoax. Um, ultimately, we did get him pardoned. Uh, but that led to me representing uh, Carter Page also in the FISA abuse mm -hmm. context. Um, and I started really to become known as the, one of the few uh, sort of top tier lawyers who was willing to take on these kind of cases uh, for, you know, I mean, really at that time, at this time, it happens to be for conservatives because of the way the power structure is in the country. Um, and I certainly am a MAGA Trump, you know, populist, uh, nationalist conservative. Uh, but really, you know, my mindset as a lawyer is is to fight for the Constitution and the constitutional rights of uh, of everyone. And, and, and you know, folks like that, um, also Rudy Giuliani, uh, mm -hmm. which will be targeted by the Southern District of New York with respect to that Ukraine probe that ultimately we got uh, we got dropped. I represented uh, Tulsi Gabbard against Hillary Clinton for that Russian asset comment uh, that you might remember. And so, yes. you know, things were kind of leading in, in this direction that I was seeing, even though I think a lot of the folks in the country really didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes at that point. But you know, it's all part of a concerted plan that you really saw kind of explode in the summer of 2020 um, with this summer of love where, uh, you know, the left really took advantage of that George Floyd situation uh, and essentially started burning down cities in America. Uh, you know, if you recall, uh, cities were just falling like dominoes yes. over the course of a few months. Um, and at that point, I had been working with attorney uh, Lynn Wood on uh, one of the Carter Page cases, a pretty well-known attorney uh, down there in Georgia, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Lynn Wood. Okay. And I could see, you know, that, that there was a need for some kind of organization that would stand up uh, for these folks. And so actually we started an organization uh, called the Fight Back Foundation, um, which uh, I started that with Lynn. Uh, it still exists. Um, you know, Lynn, Lynn Wood is proceeding with that. Now I started the NCLU, but we started okay. the Fight Back Foundation and I think it was about July 2020, just anticipating that there would be a need uh, to jump in and, and help folks in these kinds of situations. And then uh, lo and behold, August 25th uh, at night, I was just watching I was watching Fox News and just just saw a clip of what had occurred there on the streets in Kenosha and really didn't fully digest uh, what had happened just from seeing that one clip that night. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, it just kind of the reaction was, well, here we go again, you know, another Another American city is burning down, and uh, this is not good. And then the next morning, uh, Twitter just kind of exploded as people were understanding what had happened there, uh, and that it was absolute pure self defense. Um, and and I understood it very quickly. And the moment that I understood what was happening, you know, I realized that it was by far the most important self defense case in the history of the Anglo American legal system. Um, you know, the bottom line is whatever you think about Kyle Rittenhouse. Uh, if that individual uh, was was uh, convicted of murder in that situation with all of that evidence and all those videos showing uh, in high definition that it was self-defense, essentially the right of self-defense would would be eviscerated uh, in the yes. Second Amendment along with it. And so, you know, Lynn Wood and I put our heads together and, um, you know, I just said, look, somebody's got to do this. Uh, didn't look like anybody else was going to jump in. And so um uh, you know, we started the process of trying to figure out how to reach the family. Uh, Kyle's mother called me later that uh, day and I flew to Kenosha that night and um, 
uh, within within about six days, I was on Tucker Carlson. Uh, even had, hadn't even met uh, Kyle at that point, not for another few weeks. Uh, but went on Tucker uh, August thirty first, I think it was, and um, you know really helped to sort of flip the narrative to the country and to the world that you know this was indeed self defense. And so, you know, that started a very uh, a very tough uh, several months in which the entire world was really coming at him and wanted to see him you know strung up from a tree basically. Um, yep. And so uh, at that point, since I was going to be the lawyer in the case, uh, I decided to step off the board of the Fight Back Foundation so I could focus on the case, um, but continued the effort to help uh, raise funds. And so we had to raise and we did raise over two million dollars because his bail, as you may recall, was, in fact, two million dollars. Mm -hmm. And in Wisconsin, that's uh, cash bail. That's not bond. So we had to raise over two million dollars from mostly uh, very small donors uh, which we accomplished in pretty short order, uh, two or three months, and ultimately, you know, got him bailed out. I'm the one that went and physically um, extracted him from the uh, Kenosha prison there and helped uh, set up his criminal defense team, recruited the folks who actually did the trial, and um, uh, it had to be done. Um, you know, I, I think that I think that by the time our, our role was finished there, um, honestly, I don't think there was a jury in, in Wisconsin or you know, anywhere in the middle of the country, certainly, uh, that would have convicted him. So um, uh, fortunately, uh, he was acquitted. And, um, uh, you know, there's there's been lots and lots more battles to go and, and uh, since then, and there will be for some time to come. But I think that was it was absolutely crucial because, uh, you know, the left was attempting to essentially show people that Soros backed prosecutors could come in and um, convict you for murder um, if you defend yourself. And crucify anyone that they want. Exactly. Exactly. So, so um, as as that was a profound case, there was something else that happened that really to this day um, has a profound impact on the country and on 2020 and on that God forsaken election, um, January 6th. And without asking you, obviously, to delve into client attorney privilege, you still, as you said, represent most of the January 6th defendants. Um, how did that, and from what you know, obviously, what happened on January 6th and what kind of impacts can we expect going now into 2024? Yeah, so so I think the best way to think about it, and um, as as you indicated, I, I need to be a little bit mindful about um, uh, talking about January 6th because I do have so many of these cases. Um, however, I can speak generally about it for sure. And I think that, you know, what I've said many times, and I think that uh, uh, the whole country is seeing this now after we've uh, fought so hard over the last few years to sort of change this narrative and show people what really happened. I mean, you know, what happened on January 6th is that there were millions and millions and millions of Americans in the country who felt the election was stolen. And uh, there were, I'm sure, a few million um, that came to Washington, D.C. that day um, to have their voices heard because uh, they felt the election was stolen. And they didn't feel that anybody was doing anything about it. Uh, and they were upset and they wanted to uh, rally uh, with President Trump there at the Ellipse. Um, and they wanted to have their voices heard. Um, you know, obviously, uh, a lot of folks made their way to the Capitol grounds. Um, you know, there was there were there were people there that were protesting. Um, there were various things that happened, um, as I think the whole country is seeing on all sides of this. Uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, it did become a riot in certain uh, certain respects. There are there are lots of causes for that. It's a very complex event. Um, and so, you know, there's been 1,200 uh, cases that have been brought or something along those lines. I've represented probably total uh, between 40 and 50 of these folks. Uh, currently, okay. I think it's about 38. Um, and, you know, the Department of Justice, as they said explicitly, they went scorched earth. And they came after, you know, uh, over a thousand Americans, many of whom did nothing worse than um, walk around outside the Capitol building, maybe, you know, walk in through some open doors, walk around, take some selfies and walk out. Um, but the, uh, the Biden administration, the Justice Department decided to go scorched earth and uh, they turned the full force and fury of, um, you know, essentially the most powerful governmental institutions on the planet um, against regular American citizens. And so, um, you know, these trials are ongoing. Um, and there's going to be an appeals process that's ongoing. And then, um, you know, I think, uh, look, the 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 decisive uh, event that I hope is going to happen here is that uh, President Trump gets back in office. And as he's indicated, um, I think that he intends to pardon, um, you know, most or all of uh, the January 6th defendants. Um, 
you know, I can't, I can't speak to the legal merits of what happened there with respect to individual defendants, but I can say from sure. a political standpoint, I think that it, that would be the right thing to do so that the uh, the country can move forward. And then I also think that uh, Speaker Johnson and the House GOP have to release all of these tapes immediately uh, without blurred faces, without holding anything back. Uh, and they need to let the American people decide for themselves what happened that day. And that was precisely my next question. Obviously, Kevin McCarthy made many promises that he did not deliver on. Now we have Speaker Johnson. Are you confident that we are actually going to get to see some, what is it, 40,000 hours, I believe, of these tapes? Do you think it's actually going to happen? I, I, I have to say, I do not have a lot of confidence. Um, you know, I, I, I think that Speaker Johnson is an improvement on uh, on Speaker McCarthy. Um, I think it remains to be seen um, if, if he and others in the House GOP are going to live up to these repeated promises they made uh, to release all these tapes. Um, you know, so far, there's only been, I think, 90 hours or something like that that have been uh, released. I did see him make a statement the other day that, you know, more is going to be released. And that, look, it's a good thing anytime anything is released. But I but I think their plan right now is to is to blur a lot of the faces uh, and to hold back uh, some percentage based on purported uh, architectural security reasons, um, whatever, whatever that means. Um, and um, it's there's just a lot of there are a lot of things that are uh, happening with respect to it that that give me some uh, concern. But, you know, all we can do at this point is, you know, what what folks like myself and others in the January 6th community have been doing, which is to continue to put pressure on them uh, to release all the tapes and to do it as quickly as possible. Well, so then the follow up question to that, if they are not releasing it, obviously not releasing it for a reason, was January 6th a setup? And did we have, as we know now, many feds on the ground who were involved in this? So this is something I don't have to speculate about or opine about. I mean, this, this is something that there has been a lot of evidence that has already yes. been put forth in the public record uh, in these trials, including in uh, multiple of our trials. Um, it is absolutely clear. Uh, and in fact, to, to a large extent, um, the, the government has admitted this now, that there were substantial uh, there were substantial uh, undercover uh, assets uh, that were on the ground, uh, both with respect to the FBI, uh, the Secret Service, uh, the Capitol Police. Um, and uh, MPD, uh, Metropolitan Police, there in Washington D.C. Uh, so that that is not that is not in dispute. Um, it's something we've known about for some time. Um, I think that one of the good things about these videos that people are starting to focus on now, you know, and most of these videos are things that we have seen uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, but 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 the good thing now is that it, as long as it took, people are now really paying attention to some of these things. Uh, you have, you know, uh, folks like those at TMZ are actually, you know, mm -hmm. playing some of these videos. And and I think that it is really helping the, you know, the the, the great majority of Americans to see uh, that this was this was much different than had been described at the beginning by the mainstream media in terms of it being some type of attempted armed insurrection to overthrow the government. Uh, that's not what happened. Uh, there are no charges. That have been brought for insurrection. Insurrection is an actual crime uh, under the federal code. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that that has not been charged. Um, and believe me, if the DOJ could charge that, they would charge it. So that's you know that it was not an armed insurrection. It was a protest that turned into a riot in various places and ways for a variety of reasons. But absolutely categorically, uh, there were there were federal assets on the ground that day. So juxtaposing now all of this, all of these profound cases with what is happening with President Trump. And obviously you saying that not only our justice system has been weaponized against a duly elected president and against 80 plus million Americans, but all the other agencies, all of the government agencies have been weaponized against him. We're looking towards 2024, but how confident are you that with all of the cases that are being brought up against him, we will get to 2024 or that we will have him as our candidate? Yeah, look, um, I think that what is obvious at this point is that if there is to any extent, any any kind of election that, re that resembles a fair, legitimate election, Donald Trump is going to win by a landslide. He is going to win the popular vote by a landslide. He is going to win the Electoral College by an even greater landslide. And he will be the 47th president um, of the United States. Uh, and I think what you're seeing now is that obviously the left is terrified by this. 
um, because, you know, what they realize is, you know, they have opened Pandora's box and they have started down a road with respect to the, the weaponization of all of these three letter agencies of, of the full force of the federal government. Um, and it's very hard to put that back in the box. And, you know, you're looking at somebody uh, in President Trump uh, who uh, has been through so much, um, you know, the, the very government, the executive branch that was supposed to serve him um, and he was supposed to lead. Um, attempted, uh, essentially, in my view, um, a, a long-term coup d'etat. Uh, yeah. They prevented him. It's from, ongoing. They, it's ongoing. They, t- they attempted to prevent him from um, from winning. They attempted to prevent him from taking office. They attempted to prevent him uh, from functioning while he was in office. They terrorized his family. They're trying to liquidate his business at this point. Um, and you know, look, I've always been a Trump fan, um, but every day that goes by, and you see the way that this man fights, and you see the sacrifices that this man is making. Um, you know, toward the end of his life as a billionaire who could go build more golf courses and spend time with his family. Uh, yes. he, he's, a, he's a warrior. Um, and uh, I think that, I mean, that has to be clear to everyone uh, by now. Uh, so look, the left is going to, they're not going to go down without a fight. They're going to do everything possible to prevent this. Um, I think that the lawfare that you're seeing, you know, these four or five cases, 90 some indictments, a thousand years he's facing in prison. Um, I think that's backfiring on them terribly uh, with each indictment. You know, he he went up in the polls. I think to a large extent, his defense of these litigate, these frivolous lawsuits and litigations, you know, are becoming his campaign. And, and that's, you know, that's very smart of him sort of from a chess smooth standpoint, because it is it is playing right into the narrative that the actual the actual accurate true narrative uh, that he has been, um, you know, kind of kind of uh, sharing with the American people, which is, um, you know, they're coming after all of us and he just happens yes. to be standing in the way. So I, I think that I think that the things that have to be, you know, we've got to kind of watch out for is number one. Uh, President Trump's personal security. Um, you know, do not underestimate uh, the steps that the left will take to prevent him from uh, from taking office. That's number one. Number two, um, look out for things like another quote unquote pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. Look out for all these wars that are breaking out all over the world, um, and do not do not uh, you know put it um, uh, beyond the uh, you know pale of the left to attempt to start World War Three in order to have yes. some kind of excuse uh, for calling off this election. Um, and then, you know, obviously you have the fraud, you have the cheating. Um, you know, they're going to try to cheat again, no question about it. Uh, I think that we have to be aiming for, you know, lack of a better way to put it, a fraud-proof landslide. I think he's got to aim towards, and I think he will get over 100 million votes this time, because I think that the independents, uh, the, the sort of moderate old-school Democrats, are seeing that uh, this is communism versus America. It's, it's. I mean, it's a very clear choice. You know, and to, and to come back for a moment about your point about, um, you know, the swing states in the swing areas in Western Pennsylvania, you know, the Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, mm-hmm. the Rust Belt, so to speak, which is, that's, that's I, I am of and from the Rust Belt. And I, I know that, yes. you know, I know those people better than I know anything. Um, and um, really, you know, Western PA, those kind of, those kind of old school labor Democrats, um, you know, the the working class folks, uh, the con- culturally conservative folks, the folks who, you know, they want their Second Amendment, they, they want their God, et cetera. Uh, that is really the epicenter for the realignment that has occurred, um, you know, 2016, 2020 and onward, uh, where now you have the Democrat Party becoming a party of the coastal elites of mm-hmm. uh, these universities um, that are just indoctrinating our kids. You know, the Republican Party, as much as I am not a fan of the Republican establishment sometimes in Washington, D.C., but the Republican Party becoming the party of the working class uh, folks in, in places like that. Absolutely. Um, and so it's 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 ground zero. And, and and really, you know, I mean, arguably Erie, Pennsylvania, where I'm from, is, is the quintessential sort of swing area um, right up there between Buffalo and Cleveland. And so, um, yeah. look, I, I think that I think he's obviously got to win. He's got to win those states. Obviously, those are the swing states. But I think, you know, I, I really believe what's going to put him over the top, honestly, and you're seeing this more and more, is you're seeing African-American men uh, go his direction because they are seeing, you know, the government weaponized against him the way that it's mm-hmm. been weaponized against them for, for decades. You're seeing Hispanic Americans uh, who come from uh, these communist uh, countries who have moved here to get away from that, and they know what's happening, and they're terrified of it. I think that they're going in his direction. And I think most surprisingly, you're seeing young people ages 18 to 34 mm-hmm. uh, that are starting to realize that if they don't get Trump back in office, they don't have a they don't have a future. They're never exactly. going to own anything. They are never going to be able to have families. 
Um, and I think that a lot of them uh, are smart and they're waking up to the notion that, uh, that you know, people can like Trump's tweets or they can, you know, they can dislike them, they, w- w- whatever the case may be. But we, we, we are, you know, we, we are at a last stand, so to speak, with respect to maintaining the American constitutional republic and the freedoms, you know, that we, that our forefathers fought so hard for. Sure. Uh, and we don't, we don't have any more time. I mean, this is our last chance. Um in 2024 to get uh, Trump back in there. I agree with you. And something interesting that you brought up is some of those Rust Belt communities and and both you and I know that even let's look at the Serbian American community and a lot of the Europeans that actually migrated to the United States after World War II essentially were those blue collar working Kennedy Democrats, right? And, And they have since switched to to the Republican Party, particularly because of President Trump. But in light of that, an interesting appearance now is Robert Kennedy Jr. Legally, as he declared to be an independent candidate, what do you think, particularly because you're, you're in tune with some of these states and then how legally this works, can he appear on every ballot? And what do you think will the Kennedy name get him some of these voters that you and I uh, understand very well. I think, you know, and I, I'm not an expert in, in sort of the electoral process in terms of getting on the ballot, but, but I do know it's very complicated uh, for, mm-hmm. for a candidate who is not part of, you know, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, or, you know, maybe, maybe the Libertarian Party or Green Party. I mean, right. a party that's not already established and has sort of an automatic uh, nominee that can get on that ballot. Uh, it's a very sort of Byzantine, um, you know, uh, tangle of uh, dates and deadlines and petitions and signatures in order for an, an independent candidate to get on these ballots. So I, I suspect he's going to have trouble from a practical standpoint, actually getting on all uh, on the ballot for all these states. Uh, you know, to the extent he does, and you see some difference of opinion on this, but um, you know, I, I have to believe he cools much more from Biden's voters. Than he does from Trump's voters. Um, you know, yes, he is. He has some positions, uh, specifically, for example, with the the vaccines and mm-hmm. you know COVID that that may you know draw some conservative interest, et cetera. He's still a Kennedy, um, and and it's yeah. still it's still it's still the royal you know essentially the royal name um, in the Democratic Party. Um, and, and I think that where he's going to pull from mostly is. Um, you know, the, the, the center, you know, the, the center of the Democratic Party kind of heading towards the, the middle, the independence, you know, that 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 group right there, I think Trump's going to get a lot of those votes. But I think if Trump doesn't get those votes, Kennedy's going to get a lot of those votes um, uh, because, you know, folks see where the country's going. And and most of those are going to be people who are uh, registered Democrats. And, and I just have to believe at the end of the day, it's going to hurt, you know, it's going to hurt Biden um, more than it okay. hurts Trump if he runs. And one final thing, and again, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, I'm trying to be a realist, and you said something about the landslide that we essentially have to overpower the cheating machine. However, since 2020, well, even since 2016, but we didn't realize it then, laws, election laws really have not changed. So we're up against the same machine, essentially, we never managed to get any cases um, to to overturn these election laws in any of these important states that we're talking about. So can we overpower it? And why was it that we're constantly being sold a story that there was no proof of cheating? There was no proof when in fact there was ample proof, but nobody wants to look at it. How do you see this, especially from the legal pr- perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's there's actually a, any fair minded people in this country at this point who 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 think that that election was fair in 2020. I mean, I, I think everybody, if they're being honest with themselves, they they know uh, that the election was stolen um, from Trump. Um, and, you know, it, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, there weren't some more legal findings, um, you know, that established that, you know, in, in uh, stark relief. But I think, you know, I think the American people know that. I mean, be, being from Pennsylvania, you um, you know, if you're if you are watching a presidential race and at 11 o'clock at night, um, you know, a Republican billionaire real estate developer from New York is winning by 15 points in Pennsylvania, the, the race is over. 
Um, you know, it it yes. just doesn't it does not pass the smell test that all of a sudden by four o'clock a.m. Um, you know, Biden made up all that ground, I, especially if you think about, you, you know, you might remember this. Um, you, you just compare the enthusiasm gap between these two. Um, oh, there, there was a there was a rally uh, in Butler, Pennsylvania, smack dab between Erie and Pittsburgh. Um, and, it, you know, it was twilight. Uh, Trump came in with Marine One, I think. And, and uh, you know, it's just an amazing setting. But there were, I think, there were about 60,000 people there. And it was absolute yes. mayhem. I mean, it was just absolute just 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 off the charts enthusiasm and for that for that to be taking place in western pennsylvania which is a historically a bulwark of you know mm -hmm. fdr kind of jfk you know democrats and then to compare joe biden in his home state of delaware getting you know seven cars uh in circles um to, at a rally I, I mean it's just not metaphysically possible that um you know he actually won that election now i Absolutely. think that one of the one of the real problems that that the conservatives have the GOP has that that we have is um, we we do not fight and we do not win this lawfare battle. Um, you know the the left is very organized and and they're filing lawsuits. They're filing dozens, hundreds of lawsuits um, before these elections to condition the mm -hmm. battlefield, so to speak. You know Mar Mark Elias and, and his group, and um, you know obviously I'm 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 not a big fan of what Mark Elias stands for, but I, I will say I'll give him credit. Um, you know the way that they get around the country, the way that they pull resources, the way they condition the battlefield from a lawfare standpoint, it, you know infinitely better than what the than what the right uh, has done. Um, it just seems like a lot of times, uh, and I don't know if it's because people on the right are more sort of independent minded or, or what it is, but there's just not an organized effort, um, you know, to kind of fight those battles. Um, now, the reality is, is that, like you said, I mean, the laws are what they are right now, and we're heading into 2024. And, and I think the, the, the only chance is, is that while in the long run, um, obviously, we need to head back to one day voting, you know, in person, lock solid ID, paper ballots, you know, all that kind of stuff. That just has to right. be what we get back to. But we are nowhere near that right now. And so the mindset right now cannot be, oh, let's just have everybody go vote on election day because that's the way it should be. The mindset now has to be, we have to fight just as dirty and just as hard as the left does. Obviously, you know, um, I wouldn't advocate breaking the law, but I mean, we have to harvest ballots, whatever you want to call it. We need to, right. we, we need to take full advantage of the laws as they exist to get as many votes as possible, just like the left is doing. And I think that, you know, if if we do that, if if regular people get out and watch these polling uh, places the way they need to, um, mm -hmm. and if if there could be some effort by the Trump campaign, by the GOP, to have, you know, some degree of uh, attorney lawyer assets standing by to to fight these things. And, um, you know, I, I think I think that he will, I, I think that he will win. I think he will get back in office. It's going to be it's going to be a, a near run thing because of this cheating. Um, right. But I but I do think that um, I do think he's going to win. I, I think that the you know, I'm optimistic that that the Supreme Court um, and one of the great triumphs of Donald Trump was to get some of these justices appointed to the Supreme Court, which mm -hmm. is overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, I think that this time they're going to be mindful that they may well have to step in uh, to make sure that the election is legitimate and is seen as legitimate by the American people, because, you know, this can't happen. This can't happen too many more times. Um, you cannot have a free republic in which the social fabric holds together if the if the, you know, the great majority of the people do not have faith in the election. Right. outcomes. And that is the biggest problem, that the people are losing faith in the democratic process. And on top of it, the world is watching. And as we established the rule-based order, world order, uh, we have broken every single one of those rules, not just in terms of foreign policy, but even domestically. And I feel that the world is laughing at us at this point, because you just look at Argentina or some of these countries that have an election in a day by about 11, 12, midnight, they have all of the results and they know how is it possible that we count votes for days now, for weeks. It's it's just incredible that it's happening in the United States of America. Yeah, no, that's the, those are great points, and you know, and also I think what uh, what we're going to see is um, you know, look to a certain extent, uh, folks in Serbia, folks in Argentina, folks in other parts of the world have been much more. You know, the regular people 
have been much more vocal um, in some of these other countries, yes. have been much more active in terms of getting out in the streets and, and protesting the, these communist uh, tyrannical uh, regimes. Um, and we need to, you know, I mean, Americans like to think of ourselves as the, uh, you know, the very forefront of those who are fighting for freedom, fighting for liberty, fighting for free elections. Um, and the American people are, they're going to have a choice. They have a choice right now. Um, you know, all this has now been exposed. There are, there are no... There is no hiding the ball with respect to what's happening in this country and the attempted communist takeover of this country. So, you know, you, you know, you're going to have obviously, you know, some folks who have been fighting and have been out there, you know, like you, like myself, like many others who have been seeing this for some time and have been, you know, active in trying to raise the alarm. But now what's going to have to happen is the the quote unquote silent majority, the regular people yes. in this country are going to have to make a decision whether they, you know, continue to. Uh, you know, sit on the couch and have their head in the sand and hope that it all goes away and be afraid of being canceled, being afraid of losing their jobs, being afraid of, or, or, or they're going to realize that if they don't stand up and fight, they're going to lose everything anyways. They're going to lose their house. Their money's going to be taken. So, their, their, their families are going to be thrown in concentration camps. That's the direction that we're heading. And, and if people don't think that that can't happen in the United States of America, um, they got another thing coming because it has happened so fast. Uh, our constitution is being shredded uh, on a daily basis. Uh, it's happening at light speed. And so now's the time. Um, but it's going to be up to it's going to be up to regular American people to stand up and unify in a in a legal constitutional way um, to take their country back before it's too late. I agree with you that now is the time. And you brought up something very significant. The globalist elite rules by fear. And if it were not for great people like yourself, who are ready to step forward and actually defend some of these folks who are not really committing any crimes. I mean, that's I think that's the fear that everybody has, that the weaponized government can paint a target on your back and you can become a criminal overnight, even though you've done nothing wrong. That is the biggest fear that the American people have right now and who will defend them and who will protect them and who will make sure that they actually do not lose their jobs, their families, their homes, which is why, I don't know, they're not keeping their head in the sand. They're just afraid. Yeah. No, and I think what they have to realize is, um, you know, look, obviously we have, we're blessed that we have President Trump fighting for us and that we have a chance to get him back in office. And that's going to go a very, very long way. Uh, to save in this country. But I think what people have to really come to uh, terms with is the cavalry is not coming. There, there yes. is no, there are no elected politicians who are going to, who are going to save this country. I mean, President Trump is our absolute best hope uh, to turn this around. We must get him back in office, but, but in the long run, it is not going to be elected uh, officials um, uh, who, who, who save this country. It's certainly not going to be um, the GOP establishment um, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so so regular American people at every level, um, just from being just from having your voice be heard, from running to, for school board, you know, uh, do, doing everything, making sure other people get out to vote. It's going to be the regular American people who have to save themselves. Um, I, I do. I do think that, look, there's no question more and more people are waking up um, and there's no question that the alarm bells, uh, you know, ha have been rang. Um, it's just a matter of whether there is a uh, sufficient critical mass of regular Americans uh, who stand up between now and Election Day um, in 2024 and uh, turn this thing around. Amen to that. We have a country to save and America is worth saving. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Olga. I really appreciate it.